Okay, so what we're going to do is, like I said, we're going to start with where uh, we start you know, what normally is not seen, which is behind the scenes when the priest gets ready in the sacristy. We did our church tour and you saw the sacristy, which is the room back there where they have all the priest's different vestments and things. But the first thing that the father does is, uh, well, first thing I'll say is a lot of people ask the questions of why a priest wears black. And why the priest wears black is because the priest is always supposed to, in a sense, um, not be a man of the world. In a sense, like he has died to worldliness, and he should be a man of, of heaven, a man who is all about Jesus, a man who is not about this world, but is about um, the world to come, the life to come. And so the black has just always been an ancient symbol of kind of like dying to self, dying to the world. And so that's why the, the color black is used. So the first thing the priest will put on when it's time for Mass, and not every priest will use it because different, there are different styles of albs and different things like that, but this is called an anus. And what uh, the, basically the general th term for it is it's a sweat catcher. <laughs> because if you, as you notice, when you wear all of these different clothes, it gets, uh, you get really warm, especially in the summertime. Um, but uh, the amos is an ancient um, symbol of the helmet, the helmet of salvation. So when the priest would put it on, he would literally put it on like a helmet and then pull it down over his shoulders. So it's kind of like armor in the ancient days, and it, but it also it has a practical purpose. So as the priest is vesting, nothing of his black clerical clothes that would say, oh, that's a priest, should be showing. Right? Because when the priest is celebrating the Mass, he is celebrating the Mass in the person of Christ, in persona Christi. He's been called to be the representative of Christ in the Mass. He says the words of Christ in the Mass, and so none of the things that Father um, wear, everything that Father wears, should be kind of taking our attention away from this is what we normally see a Father and this is what we see a father. Sorry, I'm holding my mic in a different place till I get this on. But it should look um, it should it should look different. So the white covers everything else up. Okay. So I'm not saying even even as a deacon when they put on their white elb, which is the next thing I put on, you shouldn't see the clerical collar under that to say, oh yeah, that's Deacon Dixon. Oh, that's Deacon Mark. It should be covered um, because they are a representative of Christ in the mass not labeled as Deacon Mark, Deacon Dixon, but as a minister of Christ. And so this is supposed to completely cover. The next thing the priest wears is an alb, and it's really a symbol of our baptismal garment. And we're baptized, a white garment is placed on us as a sign of the purity and the cleanliness that, that we receive in Christ and the forgiveness of sins. Of course, the priest is also a minister of the forgiveness of sins, and so, as a reminder of that, even as we hear confessions, we'll wear the white alb as a sign of the cleansing that happens in the sacraments. Even the Eucharist has a cleansing element to it. And so the priest will put on the alb, which really means white. It's very simple. Have you ever heard of albino? That means white, right? An albino frog is like a white frog. So alb is just short for white. So that's the next thing the priest puts on is this as a reminder of his own baptism, a reminder of the life of purity that he's called to, and also just a reminder of um, the sanctifying and the redeeming work that the priest does through the sacrament in the church. The next thing is a very practical thing, but it's called a cincture, and basically it's kind of like a church belt. It holds everything together. We're wearing a lot of stuff, and these vestments and all of these things can kind of trip you up as you're coming up the stairs and things like that. And so there's a cincture, which is just a fancy name for a rope that comes around the waist and then is cinched up to kind of hold everything together. Okay? And there's all kinds of... When you go to seminary, you think, how does Father always tie those knots and tie everything so fast? And you just figure it out. After a while, you figure out tying the knots. The next thing that a priest wears is called the stole. And this is one of the most ancient symbols of the priesthood, is the stole. 
Even in Jesus' time and before Jesus' time, the priests would wear a stole when they were ministering in the temple. And that was a way that you would recognize them as the priest, because a lot of them were wearing garments like this in Jesus' day, right? So you would recognize the priest as the one wearing the stole. Another image of the stole is a yoke, right? You remember Jesus saying, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. What does the yoke do? It yokes us to Christ. Literally, Christ takes me and pulls me in the direction in the priesthood of where he wants me to go. So it's a symbol of the yoke as well. To yoke myself to Christ is no longer me, but Christ who lives in me, as St. Paul would say. So then once the stole is on, the priest will sink up everything that's there to kind of bring it all together and hold the stole down, unless the stole would probably shift and move with all the movements that the priest is doing. And the final thing the priest will put on is called a chasuble. And all of these are required uh, vestiture for the Mass. The priest will put on a chasuble, and it's kind of like, I try and explain the chasuble is kind of like um, the word, what is the Spanish word for house? Casa, right? And so it's a casable. So it's the house. The priest is putting on the church, right? The priest is to be a man of the church to celebrate the Mass in, in honor and in favor of all of the people in the church to celebrate that one Mass that is celebrated in every church around the world. So to put on the church, to put on the casa, the chasuble um, of the church. It's the last vestment that gets put on. And then, of course, I'm going to adjust my microphone so it's not up there, but then the priest is fully vested and ready for Mass in all of these different vestments. And as you notice, there's, I mean, other than the shoes, there's nothing of the black priestliness that's showing, right? And so the priest will say a prayer before Mass to ask Jesus Christ to be present and to be in him in such a way that people don't see Josh, but they see Jesus Christ. They see Jesus in the image of the priest. Any questions about that vesting? Okay. So then the next thing that happens in the Mass is that we, uh, the servers and the priest, after they say a prayer, and, and the lector will process to the back of the church and they'll get ready to process in. The thing about church is there's movement, right? It's not just about sitting here and watching. It's not about putting on a show. If they ever go to a place where you feel like they're putting on a show, it's all about the person up in the front, right? We want to make sure that the focus of all of this is Jesus Christ. Again, another reason why the priest covers everything that shows his earthly priestliness. So this is about Jesus. So when we process in, we are moving towards Christ. So what do we do? We carry in the processional cross. We have the processional cross with the servers. And then we have the light of Christ, right? Because it's the light of Christ that guides us into our life. It's the light of Christ that guides us into the darkness of life. And so we have the cross of Christ that we always follow. We have the light of Christ that guides us through light. And they, we process in. There's movement toward to where? Toward Jesus Christ. So we see here in the church, we're moving forward in what is in the line of our vision. We have the altar. We have the tabernacle. We have the crucifix. As I told you in the, in the tour, this line of vision, we're heading where? Who are we heading towards? Jesus. And this is why we process in the church. We process into the church that, and of course the deacons carry in the book of the Gospels, which is that red book that's up there. It's the Bible. It is the Gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's just broken, it's, it's taken from the actual literal book called the Bible and put in this book of Gospels that is reverenced, reverenced and placed up on the altar in a, in a special place for it so that it can be seen as this is the Word of God. This isn't just any, th any old thing that you throw down on the table next to your lamp and read it when you feel like it and let it collect dust, right? This is the Word of God. And so it also makes the connection between the altar of the Word, which is celebrated as it's preached here, and the altar of the Eucharist. The two altars, these two tables that look the same, right? So it, it makes, draws that connection. So the Word of God is processed in with us as well, carried in by the deacon and placed in its stand there until it's time to be proclaimed. And then the priest will fall in last, and then any other priest or bishop or anyone would come in the procession as well. And then once they get up to the front, there's a sign of reverence to the sanctuary, right? 
the, a sign of reverence to this is a holy place. As we talked about in the tour, this is holy ground. This is the place where heaven and earth meet. This isn't just an ordinary place where children should come and play marbles and, and uh, play around with their race cars, right? This is sacred space. This is a holy place. And so we reverence that, and we notice the, the presence of Jesus in the tabernacle Why, when we're coming into the church. And just like we do when we come in and we go into our pews, we come into the church and we show that sign of reverence with a genuflection and making the sign of the cross towards Jesus. Not towards this way, not towards this way, not back this way. We're making our sign of reverence in that focal point direction of Jesus Christ here. So then, uh, the, uh, the other thing that we want to talk about is the music. In the midst of all of this, we're singing. Because the church calls us to what did I say last time? I said full, conscious, active participation. So part of our active participation is not just watching Father do stuff, but we stand up, we sit down, we kneel, we sing, we do things, right? And then it's always been said that uh, when we sing, we pray twice. Right? Because this takes twice as much effort. Or if it's Deacon Dixon, sometimes it takes four times as much effort to sing. <laughs> you know, for some it might be easy, and it might seem like actually just talking your prayers is harder than singing your prayers. But because we, we just say that when we sing, we're intentionally um, heightening our prayer. And so we're praying twice as hard. Our prayer is twice as loud when we sing. And so we raise our hearts and our voices in song as we come into the church um, in, in, in that procession. Just like when Jesus triumphantly entered into Jerusalem, they sang, Hosanna. Hosanna to the Son of David. As, as we continue to sing as we come to encounter Jesus in the Mass. Okay? So then the very beginning part of the Mass, after Father has reverenced the altar, and I'm going to come up here, but I'm not going to go to my chair right now so you can see and hear better, but the first thing that we do is we sign ourselves with the sign of the cross, right? The very first thing is we acknowledge that I am um, a child of God, that it is in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that we begin all of our prayer. So Father begins by leading the congregation in that sign of the cross, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. And then he'll say, the Lord be with you, or something to that sense. And then we respond with, and with your spirit, right? So that's a little bit of a change. They used to say, and also with you. But we're more than just bodily beings, right? We have a spirit. And the spirit of Jesus Christ lives within us. And if the priest is standing in the person of Christ here, celebrating the Mass as the representative of Christ for this community, we certainly want to acknowledge that spirit of Jesus Christ in him. So we say, and with your spirit, Right? So then after that, there's usually a little bit of a word of an introduction, a brief introduction at the beginning of Mass, and then after that, we go right into our penitential rite. And in the penitential rite, it's actually like a mini-confession, right? Because we're confessing, we're forgiven of any venial sins, and we'll talk about venial sins and mortal sins later on, but those little sins of our lives that we like kind of catch ourselves, and they're not big things, they're just little things. You know, like maybe I'm a little short with myself, but not hurting anyone else. That's a venial sin, being upset with myself. Or um, just kind of you know, letting something move me to, to being um, frustrated with something or being a little too anxious about something. So we ask God's forgiveness for those things in the penitential act. So then we either do that by saying the Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, or we say the actual confidior, which is the I confess to Almighty God. And on Sundays, that's the preferred option of the church, that we actually say the confidior, the I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, and then, the, you know, that I have greatly sinned through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. So there's something about that beating of the breast that reminds us of the pain of sin, huh? Sin hurts. And it doesn't just hurt us, it hurts everyone around us. So that physical, literal reminder of, through my fault, it hurts. Through my fault. You know, sometimes it gets a little over-exaggerated, but you almost should hear a little bit of an echo through you. You don't watch it beating your chest to the point where you're 
black and blue, but there should be a little bit of a there should be a little bit of a hurt there to remind us of the hurt of our sins. And then after we say the confidier, then we have the Gloria, right? And where does the Gloria come from? It comes from the angelic song. The angelic song that we hear the angels singing in scriptures, especially in the book of Revelations, they're standing around the altar of God singing glory to God in the highest and peace to people of goodwill. And so we sing that Gloria. We don't just say it. We sing it. We sing with the angels and all the saints in the heavenly kingdom that same song that they are singing. Once again, we are uniting ourselves to the heavenly liturgy. This isn't just something earthly we're doing here. This isn't just make-believe and dress up. This is a heavenly thing. This is what Scripture tells us it looks like in heaven. Right? So we're participating in that by singing the glory to God in the highest with all the saints and all the angels. And then after that, we have the opening prayer. And then as soon as I'm done talking about that, we'll see if there's any questions. The first thing then for the prayer is Father says, let us pray. So we all stand. Let's stand for the prayer. This is an actual mass. Father says, let us pray. And there should be an intentional pause there because this first prayer is called a collect. What does that sound like? Collect, right? To collect something. It's called a collect. And it means that it's really collecting all of our prayers. So when Father says, let us pray, he shouldn't say, let us pray. Lord, our Father, we ask you that it should be, let us pray. Pause. You add your intentions. Full, conscious, active participation. You should be silently saying in your heart, Lord, this is my prayer to you today as I come to Mass. Lord, this is what's on my heart. Lord, this is what's weighing heavy on me. And so there's a brief pause. Obviously, it's not a full minute or two minutes, but there should be a brief three or four second, five second pause to call to mind our intentions, all of our intentions. And then the priest is the collect to collect them and offer them up to God as the one who offers sacrifice. So let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, graciously keep from us all adversity so that unhindered in mind and body alike we may pursue in freedom of heart the things that are yours. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. So just one last word about this book here. This is called The Missal. It's called the Roman Missal. I like to tell the kids in the school it's not like a missal, like pew, shooting a missal across the sky or anything. But a missal comes from the Latin word missale, which is like a little library. So it's a, it's a library of prayers. Huh? There's a whole bunch of prayers in there. So the, the nice thing is that it tells the priest everything that he should be saying or doing. It tells him right on the page. So I don't have to make stuff up. That's really good because I'm not that smart, right? I shouldn't have to make stuff up. So inside the book, you'll see that there is black writing and there is red writing. The black writing is what the priest says and the red writing is what telling, what's telling me to do. So I may be saying something and you'll see my hands go like this and it's because the red writing says, and the priest puts his hands in prayer position. So it tells me everything. So when the priest puts his hands over the gifts and calls down the Holy Spirit, it says, then the priest moves his hand in a gesture over the top of the gifts, so it tells me to do that. I'm not just like, hmm, now what should I do this time? Should I, should I go like this? Should I go? No, it tells me how to do that, which in a beautiful way, it, it's uh, comforting to know that all of these things are putting down and are, are ready for us. Um, the, so all of the prayers that I say, all of the extra prayers, any, anything special for funerals, weddings, all of that stuff, all of that's contained in here. It's a big book. It's a heavy book, but it's really a big book of prayers. And it's full of prayers and the invitations to prayer. And some of the most sacred words in the Bible are contained in here as well because it's the words of institution. The words of Jesus saying, this is my body, this is my blood. 
And some of these prayers in here are 2,000 years old. They've been used from very shortly after Jesus' death. And they've continued to be used throughout the centuries in the Catholic Church. Do you have a question, Deacon Dixon? Okay. All right. Any other questions? Before we, so this is the beginning of Mass, the introductory rites. And then after this, we go into the readings. Usually our first reading is from the Old Testament. And then we have a psalm response, obviously, from the Psalms. And then we have a New Testament reading from the book of uh, one of St. Paul's writings or the book of Revelation or something like that. Um, any of the New Testament writings are usually in the second reading. On weekdays, we only have one first reading and a psalm and then a gospel. Since we're doing a weekday mass, that's what we're going to have tonight. And then after the readings are done, there's an explanation or a time for a homily in there. So do you have your question? Yes, kiss the altar. Very good question. So when I'm doing a teaching mass, sometimes these things, since I'm concentrating on talking, I don't get to... So usually the priest and the deacon will come around the altar and they will kiss the altar. And that's always been a sign of reverence for the altar. But as I said in the tour, this is the place where heaven and earth kiss. Huh? This is the place where heaven and earth meet. And so we kiss things that are reverent, that are holy. You kiss your wife as a sign of love for your wife. So the priest will kiss the altar as a sign of his love for the church, that he's given his life, he's laid down his life for his bride, the church. Right? So if the priest is seen as an image of Christ, and the bride of Christ is the church, then it's, you could say that the priest kisses his bride. It's a sign of the priest's love for the Eucharist the sign of the priest's love for that heavenly kingdom that he's trying to draw all of these people into in this Mass, into that heavenly reality. Very good. Thank you for that, Deacon Dixon. Yes? Before Mass, the ringing of the bell is to basically just get everybody's attention and stand up instead of saying something awkward like, um, we're going to start church now I think so go ahead and stand or it's just a real simple it wasn't done before me and I kind of liked bells and so I thought let's we had these bells sitting around in closets collecting dust let's hang them up and use them so we have the bells to get and bells get our attention right monasteries for centuries have had bells they ring the bells to call to prayer so bells are supposed to in a sense make us rise and begin to pray uh, just like they did in the ancient monasteries and the same thing as they do here in the church. The first couple of weeks I put the bells in, everybody was just kind of looking around like, should we stand? Or? But now what happens? One ring of the bell, boom. It's quick. Everybody knows it's time to start Mass. And it's really nice. Even if we didn't have an announcement of this is our opening song, they could literally just have people trained to look at the songboard and stand and begin to sing without any announcement at all. Just lead right into the liturgy. Yeah. St. Patrick, Irish, green, gold. Yeah, just the color. For green and gold for the like the vestments. So each liturgical season changes color. So in two weeks we'll go into Advent. You'll see me wear purple and gold. And then for Christmas I'll wear white and gold. And Easter will wear white and gold. So different times throughout the year. On Marian feast day, I have a beautiful gold vestment. So it's gold and blue. Blue is a sign of Mary. A, symbol, a color that symbolizes Mary. And so we'll use those colors too. So different colors of vestments are just different liturgical season. Green stands for ordinary time. Just like the green grass grows in the meadows in ordinary summer days. Green symbolizes the ordinariness of our lives. Yes, the so altar cloth will be purple and all that stuff will change. Liturgical seasons, when it's Christmas, it'll all be white. Um, and then, yeah, so there's different colors for the different... Palm Sunday, it's all red, and we wear red. So it's really cool to see everything in red, to have the palm branches up behind, and it's really decorated beautiful. So we have different liturgical seasons, and we wear different colors to symbolize different things 
uh, for the different seasons. And when we have our liturgical season class or liturgical calendar class, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Good question. Yes, Deacon. It's rose. Jesus didn't pink from the dead. He rose from the dead. <laughs> right? So uh, the church has the, the third Sunday of Advent and the third Sunday of Lent where the priest is allowed to wear rose, um, which is a pink-looking color, but it's a rose color, um, and it's a color of rejoicing. It's meant to say, rejoice, we're about to Christmas, or rejoice, we're about to Easter. It just naturally draws from us a joyfulness when you wear the rose color. So we're, get, we're getting ready to get some rose color for the deacons. They're a little reluctant to wear it, but I think they'll look good in rose. Yeah. It'll match their cheeks. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so we're going to proceed with the Liturgy of the Word, and I won't uh, give a homily today. I'll talk a little bit about why we do homilies or sermons, and then we'll move into the Eucharist. A reading from the Book of Wisdom. In wisdom is a spirit, intelligent, holy, unique, manifold, subtle, subtle, agile, clear, unstained, certain, not baneful, loving the good, keen, unhampered, beneficent, kindly, firm, secure, tranquil, all-powerful, all-seeing, and pervading all spirits, though they be intelligent, pure, and very subtle. For wisdom is mobile beyond all motion, and she penetrates and pervades all things by re reason of her purity. For she is an aura of the might of God, and a pure infusion of the glory of the Almighty. Therefore, not that is sullied enters into her, for she is the refulgence of eternal light, the spotless mirror of the power of God, the image of his goodness. And she who is one can do all things and renews everything while herself perduring. And passing into holy souls from age to age, she produces friends of God and prophets. For there is not God loves, but in not one who dwells with wisdom. For she is fairer than the sun and surpasses every constellation of the stars. Compared to light, she takes precedence. For that, indeed, night supplants, but wickedness prevails not over wisdom. Indeed, she reaches from end to end mightily and governs all things well. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Your word is forever, O Lord. Your, Your word, word is, is forever, forever, O Lord. Lord. Your word, O Lord, endures forever. It is firm as the heavens. Your, Your word, word is, is forever, forever, O Lord. Lord. Through all generations, your truth endures. You have established the earth, and it stands firm. Your For word the word is, is forever, forever, O Lord. Lord. According to your ordinances, they still stand firm. All things serve you. Your, your word, word is forever, is forever o Lord. Lord. The revelation of your words sheds light, giving understanding to the simple. Your, your word, word is forever, is forever o Lord. Lord. Let your countenance shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. Your, your word, word is forever, is forever o Lord. Lord. Let my soul live to praise you, and may your ordinances help me. Your, your word, word is lives forever, forever, O Lord. So then at the time for the gospel, we all stand, and if there's a deacon, the deacon comes to receive a blessing from the priest. And the priest gives him an exact formula of a blessing that is given to deacons before the gospel that says, May the word of the Lord be on your mind, on your lips, and in your heart 
so that you may proclaim his holy gospel worthily and well. And then he makes the sign of the cross over him as the deacon. If there is no deacon, the priest says that prayer quietly to himself at the altar. And then there is an Alleluia verse. On Sundays, the deacon will process over with the book of Gospels. He would take this book and process over to the ambo with it. On weekdays, we have one book that has all the readings in it, just a big, thick book with all the scripture verses broken down into each day. So each day, there are specific readings for that. And it always begins, just like on Sunday, with an Alleluia, with acknowledging the goodness of God with the Alleluia verse that God has given us this Word made flesh in Jesus Christ. And so we begin with the Alleluia, and then the priest or the deacon says, The Lord be with you. Again, we respond by acknowledging the Spirit of Christ. And then a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. So then it's your turn. Then you are marking yourself, and a lot of people don't know this, but what you're saying is, may the word of the Lord be in my mind and on my lips and on, in my heart. You know, just like the priest has prayed over for the deacon, you're asking God to bless your mind, your lips, and your heart as you listen to this gospel, and then please, God, go out to share it with other people. Then the gospel is proclaimed. It's, we like to say it's not read. To just read something would be just nonchalantly just reading through something quickly, not paying attention to anything. To proclaim the gospel is to read it with meaning. To, this is the word of God. Uh, this is um, God's message to us and Jesus' own words. And so we have a reverence for that as we proclaim the gospel asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus said in reply, The coming of the kingdom of God cannot be observed, and no one will announce, Look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is among you. Then he said to his disciples, The days will come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man but you will not see it. There will be those who will say to you, look, there he is, or look, there he is, here he is. Do not go off, do not run in pursuit, for just as lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer greatly and be rejected by this generation. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. At this time, then, again, another sign of reverence, like he did with the altar in the beginning. The priest or the deacon, whoever is proclaiming, kisses the Word of God, kisses the Gospel as a sign of reverence for the Word of God, as everyone else is seated. So you may be seated. Then Father gives a homily, or some places call it a sermon, a homily is usually what we traditionally call it in the Catholic Church. Um, and the homily is supposed to be making the Word of God relate to us, right? So we say that Scripture is extra-temporal. It's outside of time. What was pertinent to the Jews that Jesus was preaching to, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, is still pertinent for us today. What was pertinent when God talked to Moses in the burning bush in the Old Testament is still pertinent for us today. It can still be related to us in our lives. So the difficult task or the challenging task for the priest or the deacon who is preaching is to make it relate to your life, right? So that's the challenging part, not to stand here and say a bunch of things that nobody knows anything about that doesn't relate to you in any way, but to take this message of the gospel today, the gospel of Jesus talking about the kingdom of God and making it apply to you and how it applies to you right now in the year 2019 and make it just as relevant and exciting for you to hear that word of God as it was for them over 2,000 years ago. So then there's kind of a general rule that in the, the homily of the sermon that we're, we, you know, we're obviously on weekdays, it's a shorter sermon. Weekday masses last about half an hour. 
And then on Sundays, the Sunday Masses are an hour, so there's a little bit longer sermon on Sunday. So the general rule for us is like two to three minutes on weekdays, no more than ten minutes on Sundays, unless there's like something big that the bishop wants us to push, or the bishop wants us to talk about the appeal. And so aside from the gospel reading, which is most important, we may have to add an extra two or three minutes to talk about the appeal or something like that. But that always takes a second seat to the gospel, to what we're supposed to be preaching about. So then, after the word of God, after the priest gives a homily and helps us relate the gospel and and the other readings, the Old Testament, the Psalm, the, the New Testament reading, all the readings are fair game to preach on. In fact, that's always kind of the fun task that I try and do is I try and at least give a little bit of a nugget and touch about each of the readings. Because the church in her beautiful wisdom, if you look at the readings, they really are all connected. There really is something about that first reading that says something about the gospel. There really is something about that psalm that speaks deeper about the gospel that we just heard. It's all the word of God. And it's connected, and the church has beautifully searched through the Bible and said, you know, this psalm goes really good with this is what, when Jesus is saying this. So they put it all together in a book that's called the Lectionary, a book of readings. Okay? So then the preacher preaches, um, the priest or the deacon preaches about that um, and tries to help us understand that. And then to continue on the liturgy of the word after the priest is uh, seated, there should always be a brief moment of reflection. Um, We shouldn't just go from that homily when he's really gripping at your heart and, and getting you to understand the gospel to just right away, okay, let's just go into something else, right? There should be a pause. There should be a little bit of time for personal reflection in there. I think even myself, I'm guilty of that sometimes. I start to think, well, my homily went closer to 10 minutes than I wanted it to, so I probably better hurry into this next thing. And so I intentionally try and sit myself down and take 10 deep breaths. (laughs) Sometimes it's hard to hold myself down for those 10 deep breaths. But I think it's good, especially when... Sometimes there might be kids crying and things, but that's okay. It doesn't bother me to just take the time to let the people in the pew to reflect on that as well. And then after that, on Sundays, we go right into uh, the creed, what we profess. After we've heard the word of God, we say, you know what, I'm going to say I believe in this. So we have the creed. And we'll learn later on there are two creeds, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, but the one we say on Sunday Mass is the Nicene Creed, which comes from the Council of Nicaea, when um, we had to deepen our understanding of what we were saying. The first Apostles' Creed had 12 parts of it, and it was very vague. It just, I believe this, I believe this, I believe this. And it was the, the, the legend is, is that the apostles all got together and said, what are, each one of you can have a statement of belief, and we're going to put this into a creed. And so each one of them got to say, you know, the first one, maybe Peter would have stood up and said, I believe in one God. And then the next one maybe stood and said, I I believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior. And the next one said, you know, but we also believe in the Holy Spirit. And so they formulated this creed. Well, after a while, after lots of um, discussion and lots of people disputing with the church, they thought, you know, we really need to explain a little more about what we mean about one God what we mean when we say we believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior. So they expanded on that at the Council of Nicaea, which is the Nicene Creed, which is what we profess on Sundays, and what you will profess on the night of your confirmation at the Easter Vigil. After the Nicene Creed, then we have the prayers of the faithful, where we gather all of the prayers that the priest um, is supposed to be aware of. What are the needs of his community? Um, What are the needs? What do we see that our world, our community our church needs, and we offer those prayers, not just for ourselves here at St. Pat's, that's part of it, but the bigger church around us, the needs of the government leaders and the civil society around us, the needs of uh, um, the, uh, our community, our local community. Maybe there are needs locally right here in North Platte that are recognized that are needed, and then bigger needs around the world. And finally, we always close it off with a prayer for the dead. Um, The church has always given a formula for those prayers, um, and the last one should always be prayers for the dead. And then after that, we sit 
for the, co the collection at that time. Since ancient times, even in the Acts of the Apostles, we hear how they went out and they took collections to support the church, the work of the church, to be able to keep the lights on and it warm on a Thursday night. Um, so that collection is passed around, that collection basket, and it's brought forward with the gifts. Now the gifts are brought forward with the family and they symbolize all of our gifts, right? Each one of us has something to offer Jesus in this Mass. That's when Father, why Father, in a few moments you'll hear me say, pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours, you sacrificed in this Mass too. You have something to offer here. As a priestly people, baptized as a priest, prophet, and a king, priestly people offer sacrifice. So when we come to Mass, when those gifts are being brought forward by a family, that family represents all of us. That family is a representation of all of our prayers, all of our gifts being brought forward into the community, okay? To be offered here at the altar. So then the gifts of bread and wine and water are brought forward along with that collection. The collection is placed in front of the altar, just like the collection of goods was placed in front of the ancient altars in the Jewish and the Israelites when they were offering sacrifice there was an incense offering and things like that that were placed around the altar the same thing we place that here and then we place the bread and wine and water on the altar any questions up to this point because then we're moving into the liturgy of the Eucharist I explain everything I hope so <laughs> and we'll have more time if a question comes up later when we get down uh, to have our dinner we'll have more time the rest of this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and go through the Eucharistic part of it to maintain the reverence and sanctity of Jesus' own word. And then at a certain point, I'll stop and say, are there any questions about what I just said? But I do try and explain still what I'm doing and why I'm doing what I'm doing. Okay? So once the deacon brings the gifts to the altar, the deacon has usually already set up the altar. So what the deacon sets on the altar is the first thing that you'll notice, lots of these fancy things with green color on them, and this is called a burst, not a purse, but a burst. And inside of there is what's called a corporal. And a corporal is a cloth that's laid on top of the altar, and this is a new one, so I know that it doesn't have any crumbs of Jesus on there, but it's folded in a particular way that when, if at the end of the Eucharist, when it is folded up, any crumbs of Jesus that might have fallen are contained in this because I have folded it into a square and all crumbs would stay in there. And then it's purified and cleansed in a certain way, right? Because we believe that this really is going to become the body and blood of Christ, so crumbs of this bread that becomes the body may happen to fall onto here. So we want to catch those and, and be able to, to, to reverently take care of those. So the deacon opens up, if there's a deacon the corporal on the altar, and this is where all of the sacred vessels will be placed on top of this. And there's another one here for the chalices when we have multiple chalices. The next thing that comes off is the chalice veil. It's a simple cloth that covers up the chalice. The chalice is this. It's not a cup. It's a chalice. And it's a sacred vessel that's meant only for the blood of Christ. This isn't meant to go and drink tea out of after Mass. Or as I tell the kids, we don't drink Kool-Aid out of this chalice. We only drink the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And something that's worthy of the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is something that is precious and gold, right? I wouldn't put the precious blood of Jesus Christ, my Savior, in a Dixie cup. So it says something about what we're celebrating and what the Eucharist is by the dignity of the vessel. And so this chalice veil reminds us of that. It's just a, a very brief reminder of the sanctity of what we are celebrating. So then this is just folded up and placed to the side for the rest of the remainder of Mass. Underneath of there, the next thing is called a pall. <laughs> There's lots of names for these things, and most of them derive from the Latin language for a pall. The pall is as a practical use of covering the chalice. We have a big church and about two months ago, we had flies buzzing around everywhere. I don't know about you, but I'd like my precious blood of Jesus Christ without flies, please. You know? Because think about it, what would happen if a fly goes into there? Now that's got the precious blood of Jesus. 
in it. So what do I do with that fly? I'm going to have to go and take care of that fly, bury that fly. So it's probably better if I just keep the sacred blood sacred and cover it in a sacred way. So this is just a nice decorative cardboard thing that goes over the top of the chalice. It's called a pall, and it protects the blood of Christ. So the chalice is here. The corp or the uh, purificator is just a simple, another white cloth that's used to wipe the rim of the chalice when people are receiving or when Father receives just to simply purify or cleanse the outside rim of the chalice. And then the other thing that's on here is the paten. This is just a, a, a gold plate. And on top of there is placed the host which is the host of the piece of bread that will become the body of Christ. But it's put on, not consecrated yet, it's put on a patent, a gold patent, on something that is reverent, that also, once it is broken in order to give and to share, it will maintain those crumbs on top of there until Father brushes them off into the chalice. Okay? So again, another sacred vessel for a sacred thing. It's there. So the gifts of bread and wine and water are brought up. Father has the altar set up. I have this missile stand. All this is is a book stand. It's fancy and looks nice because we're putting it on top of the altar, right? This sacred place of sacrifice. I wouldn't want to just put a plastic piece of junk up on the altar. I would want to put something reverent because why? Again, it's drawing attention to the sanctity and the sacredness of what we are celebrating here. We're doing what Jesus told us to do, celebrating this union, this marriage, in a sense, between heaven and earth. So it's a sacred object that's put on the altar in order to hold the book of prayers. So before Father blesses the bread and the wine, the wine and and the water are mingled in the chalice, and the prayer that the priest prays inaudibly, it's supposed to be prayed so only he hears it under his breath, He pours the wine into the chalice, and if there are more chalices, he pours the rest of them. And then as he mingles the water, he says, by the mingling of the water and and wine, by the mingling of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ who humbled himself to share in our humanity. That's a powerful prayer. Some priests have said that's one of the most powerful prayers that's prayed during the Mass that this mingling of the water and wine may remind us of the mingling of Christ coming to share in our humanity and how we are drawn into his divinity through this sacred liturgy. So then the priest offers the blessing. This is an amazing part of the blessing because this is exactly almost in the identical words but in the English language of what Jesus celebrated in that Seder meal or in that Last Supper, that Passover meal that Jesus was celebrating on that last supper night with his disciples, right? He had the 12 of them gathered around the table and he looked up and he said, just like every good Jew did in his day with his own family around his table, he looked up at them and he said, the prayer of blessing, which is the prayer of asking God to bless this bread, to make it holy. So what we say is, Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received this bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. And what Jesus said in his own language would be the prayer that is still celebrated today at Passover meals, Barakaronai Elohim. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Here we see an immediate connection to the Last Supper. And immediate, we should be almost in a sense drawn into those chambers of that upper room with Jesus, saying these very words with his disciples. And in the same way, the priest will take the chalice and mask God's blessing upon the chalice, the wine, the fruit of the vine. Blessed are you, Lord. Barakaronai Elohim. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. For through your goodness we have received this wine we offer you fruit of the vine and work of human hands that will become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. So these are ancient prayers, more ancient than 2,000 years of Christianity, 
thousands of years the Jews have been praying these prayers. Some would say this is our direct connection to our Jewish brothers and sisters. And Jesus was a Jew. So this is our direct connection to Jesus' own lineage right here in the Mass as we're blessing and breaking and sharing this bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ as Jesus did with his disciples. After the priest is done with that, there's another prayer. So some, a lot of these prayers are said inaudibly or quietly. And the reason why they're meant to be said that way is because Jesus himself didn't say everything publicly, did he? Jesus often went off to pray to God the Father with the God the Father alone. Him and the Father went off to pray together. There are some things that the priest prays at the altar that are meant to be a prayer of Jesus Christ, the priest living and true in him, with the Father, as the priest is standing in persona Christi, in the person of Christ for this community, that has been called out of this community to pray in a special way in the person of Jesus Christ, in the spirit of Jesus Christ. And so the priest bows gently and prays. Um, now that I'm talking, I forget my prayers. Um, I need to go back to my place. So all of these prayers, again, are in the Missal here. With humble spirit and contrite heart, may we be accepted by you, O Lord, and may our sacrifice in your sight this day be pleasing to you, O Lord. So all of that is said under his breath quietly, the prayer between him and God the Father. And then as his hands are washed by the servers, a ritual washing, it's also a, like a ritual cleansing, like a cleansing from sin, but it's also a practical thing as well, right? Back in Jesus' day when they were celebrating those first Eucharists, they were walking around on dirt streets and lots of things had dirt and dust on them. So to literally wash your hands was a practical thing needed to be done. But the spiritual washing of that is done, and as the priest washes his hands, he prays this prayer quietly to himself, but I'll say it out loud tonight. Wash me, O Lord, of my iniquity, Cleanse me from my sin. So the priest acknowledges, I'm not worthy to be celebrating this Eucharist. I'm a sinner just like everybody else here. Wash me, O Lord, of that iniquity. Wash me of my iniquity because I am not equal to God. And cleanse me of my sins. Make me worthy to celebrate this sacrifice for them. As Jesus laid his lives down for them, for us. So the priest washes his hands and then he comes back and we open up the dialogue before the Eucharistic prayer as we all stand. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice in your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. And then we have just kind of an invitatory and inviting prayer into the Eucharistic celebration right here. Lord, look with favor, we pray, upon the sacrificial gifts that we have offered here, that celebrating in mystery the passion of your Son, we may honor it with loving devotion. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. You notice the direction of the prayer. It's to the Father. It's uh, directing our prayers to the Lord, just like Jesus' prayers were directed to him. So then we have what's called the preface. It prefaces, it comes before the actual words of institution that Jesus prayed. And so it's an invitation again, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, offering and recognizing that it's our duty and privilege to give God thanks in this Mass. For just as through your beloved Son you created the human race, so also through him with great goodness you formed it anew. And so it is right that all your creatures serve you. That's us. All the redeemed praise you. That's all the saints and those who already enjoy the heavenly kingdom. And all the saints with one heart bless you. Therefore, we too extol you with all the angels. As in joyful celebration, we acclaim. And then we sing that heavenly voice 
that heavenly song of the angels, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And then we kneel. This is the most sacred part of the liturgy, the actual words of Jesus, the institution, the body, the bread and the wine become the body and blood at this point. So this is when we're going to notice there are bells rung. There are bells rung to draw our attention to this heavenly and divine reality that's happening before us. Not just to wake us up, right? But to remind us there's something holy here. Something sacred here. The Holy Spirit is truly alive and coming down on this bread and wine, which is ordinary, to make it the body and blood of Jesus Christ, which is out of this world, that he offers to us. So the bells signify this sanctity of what we celebrate. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. And then he calls down the Holy Spirit. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the priest does that motion. You see my hands literally gathering the Holy Spirit and calling it down upon these gifts. At this very moment, the Holy Spirit is truly alive and present, not only in us, but around this altar protecting and sanctifying what is happening here in this moment where we, in a sense, take ourselves from here and are placed in that upper chamber and to celebrate the Last Supper with Jesus. On the night he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. So what happens is when the priest says those exact words of Jesus Christ, those words are to be spoken into the bread. They're supposed to be spoken, as it says literally here, the priest speaks these words, Jesus' own words, into the bread. Now that bread literally has become for you and I the body of Christ through his words. Then the act of showing, to show all of you when the priest raises his hand, the body of Christ, the bells ring, the body of Christ is truly present. And then he takes the chalice. When supper was ended, in a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. And once more, giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in memory of me. So at this time, the body and blood, the bread and wine have become the body and blood of Christ, which is why we show them to everyone. Behold, our King, our Lord and Savior is here and alive and present with us, and he's giving himself to us in this Eucharist. At the end of that prayer, then the priest, we acknowledge, we proclaim our faith. Our faith is a mystery. How this bread and wine become the body of Christ is still a mystery to us. But we believe in faith that if Jesus said that it is, if Jesus told us that we must eat this and drink this to have eternal life, then we do. We believe. And so we say the mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. That is a profession of our faith. It's a mystery. Then the priest continues with these words. Therefore, as we celebrate the death, your death and resurrection, O Lord, we offer you the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, 
we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is gathering us into this oneness in this prayer and in the body of Christ. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world. Again, we're praying with the church universal all around the world. And bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis, our Pope, Joseph, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection. We're praying for the dead, our loved ones who have gone before us, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles, with St. Patrick, and with all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. So at the end of the prayer, then the priest continues to pray this prayer and he says, through him, with him, and in him, who is he talking about? God the Father. Through God and with God and in God. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is God forever and ever. Through him and with him and in him, O God, you, through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours forever and ever. Amen. And then we stand and we say the Our Father. The priest has an invitation to the Our Father, and he says, at the Savior's command, right, because Jesus commanded us to pray this way, and formed by divine teaching. Formed by divine teaching is what we are being done in us. Through the scriptures and through this Eucharist, we are being formed. So at the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. So now just a quick note. We didn't cut up the Our Father, right? So I know many of our Protestant brothers and sisters whom we love um, continue on with that, and they don't have that break in there. But if you read the Our Father in the Gospel, Jesus doesn't say, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever, right? That was added by Christians a thousand years later or more. What Jesus prayed is what we pray at the beginning. Then the priest interjects the prayer in between. And then in unity with our Protestant brothers and sisters, we say, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So just a little note to why we break that up. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. And then the deacon usually says, let us offer the sign of peace. So we offer peace to one another. We want to make peace with each other before we receive the body of Christ, before we approach the altar of grace. And so we make peace. It's not a time to say, like, what are you guys doing tonight? Um, what did you guys do last night? Are you coming next week? It's a time to say peace be with you. And we say peace be with you. Your loved ones, obviously, you can hug and kiss and things like that, but it's a time for peace. And so we offer peace. Father already offered it to you, so there's no need for Father to come out there and do peace with anybody. He already just said, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. He just offered peace to everybody here so that he can go back to the work of the altar. So we offer peace while Father prepares the altar.
Again, we go to the tabernacle, the place of where um, whatever is left after the Mass is kept there. And so we bring that forward. That way, whatever is left from this Mass can be put back in there as well. So then this is called the fracturing rite. As we say, the Lamb of God, which is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Again, this revelation of this altar and this scene of the Eucharist being celebrated in heaven is what we are saying here on earth. And so we say, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. So then as you kneel, Father breaks the bread. There's a bread, right? What did Jesus do in the gospel? He took bread and broke it. And as he breaks it, he mingles a fraction of the body of Christ into the blood of Christ as the sign of the cross and says, may, I, may the body and blood of Christ bring those who receive it to eternal life. Again, another prayer he prays silently to himself. And then as he genuflects, he says the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, who by the Son of the living God who by the will of the Father and the work of the Holy Spirit through your death give life to the world. Free me by this most holy body and blood from all my sins and from every evil. Keep me always faithful to your commandments and never let me be parted from you. All of that is said quietly as Father genuflects before he receives the Eucharist. And then he says, uh, Behold the Lamb of God, the, uh, the prayer and showing everyone the body and blood of Christ. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. So then, the only say the word, my soul shall be healed, right? That comes directly from the gospel. It comes directly from the centurion who comes and asks Jesus, heal my servant. And Jesus says that today I'll come to your house. And he says, I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. Sometimes we don't feel worthy to receive our Lord Jesus Christ under this house. If we see ourselves as a temple of God, as a temple of the Holy Spirit, a dwelling of the Holy Spirit, this is the house that we don't feel worthy to receive him at times. But he says, only say the word in my soul. Not my servants. My soul will be healed that invitation to heal us and make us worthy of the Eucharist. Then the priest says inaudibly to himself as he receives the body of Christ, may the body of Christ keep me safe for eternal life. Amen. And the same with the chalice as he makes the sign of the cross. Lord of Christ, keep me safe for eternal life. Amen. At this time, other ministers usually come and help the deacon and father with all of this. Normally, the deacon and father will take the sinner's places with the body of Christ, and the other ministers will take the other places with chalices, um, distributing the body of Christ in transepts and the blood of Christ as well. Tonight, uh, this is a Mass, um, so if you want a blessing, you can come forward with your arms crossed if you're just joining. If you would like to receive the Eucharist, this was a full Mass, we will give you the body of Christ. Non-Catholics, you can have a blessing if you would like. If you'd just like to get a blessing, Mitchell. Mitchell, you don't want a blessing? Okay. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. I bless you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. 
God bless you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The body of Christ. God bless you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. Once communion is finished, the deacon and father will finish cleaning up the altar and putting things away after Mass. It's a time for all of us to say a prayer of thanksgiving, even if we weren't able to receive the Eucharist, to just be thankful. To thank God for the opportunity of this journey that you're on, the opportunity to be able to learn more about the the Mass and what Jesus has intended for us in the Mass. While Father and the deacon are cleaning things up, Father also washes his fingers. That's called an ablution washing. It's just washing any crumbs of the body of Christ that have come off onto his fingers. Again, if it is the body of Christ, we don't want to show any slightest irreverence to Jesus, so we make sure that those things are washed off of our fingers. Deacons are also welcome to do that, or any extraordinary ministers would be welcome to do that as well as a sign of reverence for the body of Christ. And then they purify the vessels. And in the purifying of the vessels, we say the prayer, what is passed to our lips as food, O Lord, may we receive in purity of heart, that what has been given us in time may be our healing for eternity. Amen. And this is again said by the priest and the deacon inaudibly under our breath. Everything is just put back together on top of the chalice as it was before. With the veil and the pall, the burst. Any crumbs that might have fallen off of the body of Christ during Mass are folded up into the corporal so that there's no chance of those crumbs falling off onto the floor. placed back in the verse and then we're ready for the closing prayer let us pray nourished by these sacred gifts O Lord we give you thanks and beseech your mercy that by the pouring forth of your spirit the grace of integrity may endure in those your heavenly power has entered through Christ our Lord the Lord be with you May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Mass is ended. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. So you'll notice the priest and the deacon as the song begins, they'll kiss the altar as a final sign of reverence. And then the procession out goes, and we continue to sing as we're being sent out into the world, as we have received the Word of God and the Eucharist, then we go out into the world to take Jesus into a world that is so in need of meeting Jesus, huh? So in need of encountering Jesus. Any questions? You guys can be seated. A little over an hour. <laughs> it's a long, long mass for a weekday, but anything there that I did that you didn't understand or that, you, uh, that I didn't explain well enough? Any immediate questions while we're here and then we'll go down and eat and if you can have time to think about some questions and then we'll ask some more questions down there but uh-huh. well because we're not re-crucifying we're not re-putting him up on the cross but we're calling to mind that sacrifice right so it's called recapitulating. So 
so as we are recapturing the essence of that night and the words of Jesus Christ when he said, when you, as often as you gather together, do this in remembrance of me. So he literally told us, when you gather, this is how you do it. You gather around the word. You gather around the word of Christ and then the word of Christ incarnate, become flesh and give. So Jesus gives them in, us himself in the Eucharist, but we're not re-crucifying him, right? We're not yelling as part of the Mass, crucify him, crucify him. We're recapitulating it. We are calling to mind that sacred night and calling into mind and into our hearts those sacred words of Jesus. This is my body. If you just think about that sometimes, maybe when you're celebrating the Eucharist or when, you, when you're at Mass this Sunday and you hear Father say the words, this is my body. He's saying those words in the person of Christ. He's calling to mind that very night. You can imagine what was going on in Jesus' heart as he gave his body to them. Right? He had already taught them in John chapter 6. He had already taught them you need to receive this bread of life. He already taught them that we'll never run out, that it will continue to be multiplied as he multiplied the loaves. But to just hear those words, this is my body, which will be given up for you. And then this is my blood, the blood of a new covenant, not the old covenant that was sprinkled by some lamb or fatted calf. This is the new covenant of the paschal lamb, the Easter lamb who will rise after he's been crucified. So we don't re-crucify Jesus. We call to mind. We call to mind those words. Why? Because he told us to. And we call to mind it in a powerful way as we celebrate the Eucharist in his own words. The most sacred thing that we do as Catholics is just do what Jesus said. Any other? Good question. Thank you, Deacon. So we will uh, go back to down the way. We'll say a meal prayer real quick. You guys can go and get some chicken noodle soup and begin to let some of this stir around in your minds and I'll be down there in just a minute and we will um, have a little bit of discussion for the rest of the evening. It's 7.30, so let us pray. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen.